What you're seeking is a blessing from God. You must expect a miracle. You have the power of choice. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Life Today Live. I'm Randy Robinson. Good to have you here. We have so many great guests this week, so much uh, good quality, in-depth content, not the shallow stuff you're seeing on the rest of your social media. This actually will help you in your life, and uh, today it's one of those shows. Now, <laughs> as I get into this, I, I'm, I'm going to want to share a little backstory with you, and I, I wrote a book years ago called God Wants You to Be Happy. And um, <laughs> got all sorts of pushback because of the word happy. Well, today's guest has a book, and it is called Stop Chasing Happy. Well, uh, Phil Waldrip, our guest today, and I are actually very much on the same page. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we're going to tell you why. We're going we're gonna to get into this idea of happy because there is much confusion over the connotation of, of the word. And God knows in our culture... Uh, you know, even in our Constitution, the pursuit of happiness. Well, what is that? What should that be? Because because of the Word, it can go either way. And so we're going to talk about that. Phil Waldrop is an evangelist and author. Uh, he's written numerous books, including Beyond Betrayal, uh, Reaching Your Prodigal, and the latest. He's also uh, the man behind a couple of things that you might have heard about. There's the Celebrators Conference, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And then the Women of Joy Conference, which... Um, I believe Sheila Walsh, Phil, is she, does she actually speak at one of your conferences? Yes, she does. She has spoken several times. Okay, so Sheila is part friend. of that as well. So, Phil, great to have you on Life Today Live. Well, thank you, Randy. I have looked forward to this because I have so much love for you and your family all these years. So it's just great to sit down and talk to you and kind of not only get to know each other a little bit better, but talk about something we're both very passionate about. Absolutely, and I want to dive right into this topic because uh, – the idea of happy and happiness is certainly rooted here in, in our country and in, in our constitution. Um, but it's also, it's, it's on the psyche of most people. We're all looking for a little happiness, but tell us why you're saying that we should stop chasing happy. Well, I'll tell you how I kind of came to that conclusion was when I started researching, because, you know, traveling, people always would say to me, I want to be happy. I just want to be happy. Mm -hmm. They talk about their marriage. I just want to be happy. They talk about their job. I just want to be happy. And everybody wants to be happy. So what I discovered was I started looking around for all these people who were always trying to do something to be happy. And most of them were not happy. <laughs> then I started looking around for people that I genuinely thought had joy in their life, who were truly happy. And all of a sudden, I discovered not a single one of them was trying to be happy. <laughs> happy was a byproduct of them doing what God called them to do and what God purposed for them to do. So if you go around and you just like, I'm going to be happy, because then you have to fill in the blank. Mm. You know, oh, I'd be happy if, if I had a different job. I would be happy if I had a different spouse. I had a lady tell me once, I'd be happy if I had different kids. Um, you know, the blank goes on. I'd be happy if I had money. I'd be happy if I lived somewhere else. Well, anytime you have that big if, that tells me you're chasing happiness, and you think if you fill in that blank, you're going to be happy. And I hate to disappoint you, mm -hmm. but if you fill in the blank, you're probably not going to be happy. <laughs> That's why there's people like in marriage that say, boy, I'd be happy if I had a different spouse. So they get a divorce, mm -hmm. and they go out and they find the love of their life. And then, you know, two years later, they're like, boy, I'd be happy if I had a different spouse. It's not Happiness is not in a person. It is not in stuff. It comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ that is even deeper, that we find what God created us to do. And once we do it, once we find what his purpose is for us and we do it, happiness is a byproduct. Because you have to remember, when we talk about happiness, I, I always point this out to people. Everybody has a different definition of happiness. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, some people see happiness as, well, life is just fun all the time. So if I'm happy, you know, I'm never going to have any problems. I'm never going to have any struggles. I'm never going to get sick. None of my friends are going to get sick. And Or as I like to say, it's Disney World every day, 24-7. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not a realistic view of life. And then other people say, you know, well, I, I think happiness just means that it's the absence of problems. Well, welcome to life. 
because you're going to have problems in life. Yeah. It's part of it. Yeah. But how do we have happiness in the midst of that? That's what I want people to understand because you can truly have a contentment and a happiness. And by happiness, I mean you enjoy life. Every day you get up and you just have a zest for life. And when you go to bed, you just can't wait to get up tomorrow. Now, when you get to that point in your life, even amid the problems, you have found happiness because you have found something worth living for. That's what I mean when I say stop chasing happiness, start pursuing your purpose. So you, you used a phrase there. You said enjoy life. Mm -hmm. And therein lies some of the confusion around the term. Uh, if we look up happiness in the dictionary, in American Dictionary, you'll see it has two definitions. One is joy and the other mm -hmm. is pleasure. And so when, right. when you're talking about always chasing the pleasure, yeah, you're right. I mean, we, we see people in the church and outside of the church, and that just, that is a, a grass is greener on the other side kind of thing. It, it mm -hmm. never, ever satisfies. But when you're talking about joy, and I know you know this, we go to uh, uh, blessed are the peacemakers, but, you know, blessed, mm -hmm. the, the Beatitudes, that mm -hmm. word blessed, uh, that in church we pronounce blessed because it sounds more righteous. Uh, <laughs> that that word makarios in the Greek is the same word they use for happiness or joy. It's joy. It's mm -hmm. not the pleasure kind of self seek self serving you know pleasure seeking right. kind of thing. But it's what you're talking about. It's the, the deeper that's satisfied, even in the circumstances that are unpleasant. We can still have. A level of joy and so what you're right. what you're saying is is so critical that we understand and get to here's part of the question now jesus lays it out in the beatitudes how to actually have true joy but what do you what have you found are some of the the ways that we can experience this joy <laughs> and this joy made full that jesus said he came to give us well you know when i started researching happiness i went to the bible and found myself spending all my time in a little book called philippians and we often think of the book of Philippians as the joy-filled epistle of Paul, because mm -hmm. Paul talks in there about, you know, rejoice in the Lord. Um, and again, I say rejoice. And so when people read that, they go like, well, yeah, but if I was Apostle Paul, I could say that. And I say, well, and I hang on a minute. Paul is writing from prison. He's probably been beaten. Right. He's, he, you know, he doesn't have an air conditioner or he doesn't have a heater. So the, the temperature is never right. And yet in the midst of that, he said, I rejoice in the Lord. And I think it, it comes back, happiness comes back to this, Randy. First of all, is Paul understood the big picture that all of us who are Christians, all of us have one primary purpose in life. Our mission, as I like to say, is to glorify God. All of us want to glorify God. That's what our mission is. Then the purpose is where God's put us on the team. I like to use the illustration of a football team. You know, I'm from Alabama, and this time of season, yeah. we like to talk. We don't like to talk to those Texas A&M people. I was going to say, right I, you know, <laughs> my, my son is down there working right now. We are Aggies in our family, so gig them. Oh, there you go. Out. All right. I, I I gave you your setup there for the perfect, for <laughs> yeah, perfect <did>. setup. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things you think about a football team, you know, there's a lot of components to a football team. There's the coaches, there's the trainers, there's the water boys, there's the players, there's the fans, there's the cheerleader. <clears throat> All of them have the same purpose. Same goal is to win the football game. Mm. Everybody wants to win the football game, but everybody has a different role. What the trainer does is different from what the quarterback does. And even on the team, you know, what the linebacker does is different from what the tackle does. Mm. Everybody has a specific job to be. Everybody can't be the quarterback. Everybody can't be the wide receiver. And teams, you know, we talk a lot about teamwork when we talk about teams. Um, when a team is really winning is when everybody has decided to do their job, you know, and they're not mad because they didn't get the football or somebody didn't throw it to them. Nope. You know what? It's not fun being the, you know, the nose guard, to be quite honest. So you don't ever hear people interviewing the nose guard after a football game. But most good nose guards know what their job is. They know what their assignment is and they do it. And I think when we think about the body of Christ, all of us are called to glorify God. That's the comparison to winning the game. 
but all of us have been given a different assignment. And the assignment might be, in our minds, we might be a water boy. But trust me, any player will tell you how vital the water boy is during a break and during a timeout, that they can get a little water in their system to refresh them. All of us find that role. We may not get the applause of the crowd if we're not seeing or speaking. Um, It may be something so, at least in the minds of the world, insignificant. I met a lady once who told me that she spent a whole year trying to find out her purpose. And she discovered her purpose was right in front of her. She cared for her physically and mentally challenged brother. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, by caring for him, I could glorify God. Mm -hmm. And that's what God put me on the earth for. And she found a happiness through caring for him. She said she never found anywhere else. And I think that's when we, you know, the devil tries to convince us all, Randy, you know, what God wants you to do. No, that's not any fun. It's not any good. You need to do what somebody else wants you to do. Oh, you need to go. You need to go be, you know, Randy Robinson. You need to be go be a great singer. No, we all find what our purpose is. And once we're willing to accept it and to do it with excellence and glorify God, then the result is every day is going to be a joy doesn't always mean it's fun. You know, when you have a day when you have surgery, (laughs) that's not a a fun day. Or, you know, a loved one dies, that's not a fun day. But through it, you can have joy because you know all of that is temporary because as Christians who are glorifying God, ultimately there will be that lasting eternal joy that we have. Yep, absolutely. Okay, now you're hitting something that I think is really, really big. We we have this tendency um, for ourselves and also as we look at other people to, to go with your analogy to say, look, I, I'm a running back. You're not a very good running back. You need to be more like me or you're not do you know, you're not important right. or you're out of God's will because you're acting like a safety. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, running backs are where it's at. Or even right. someone off the field, you know, you're over. Well, I, I saw a game last week where someone uh, had to leave the game because he was dehydrated. So you talk about the water boy being important. That's right. All the players, that, you know, if the players want to look down on the water boy. Well, fine, get rid of the guy with the water or the Gatorade and, and see how long you last, on, you know, when you're playing mm-hmm. down here in Texas, right, or in Alabama. Right. We have this tendency to compare ourselves to each other. And, and mm-hmm. it goes both ways. One, to find out, oh, well, I'm just not as great as them, or I'll never be as good as them. That's self-comparison that's self-defeating. Or the other one where we're critical of everybody for not acting the way we think they should act. Oh, that church over there, they use this mm-hmm. kind of music, and uh, God doesn't love that as much. Or that that pastor over there, he's focused more on this area of ministry, and, and he totally doesn't talk about He didn't even mention this last weekend. And, and we're critical because these comparisons— comparison is it not one of the biggest killers of joy in the lives of people of course it is because you can always find someone who's smarter richer better looking uh who can do anything better than you can do and if you if you don't think if you think you're the best at something just hang around because (laughs) trust me somebody will come along who does it better because you're going to age and i think that comparison goes two ways one as you were commenting We tend to compare to other people and we think, well, if I could be like them, then I would be happy. But there's the other side I see so often in the church. You hinted at it. If everybody else was like me, Mm -hmm. then I would be happy because then they would be validating me. Well, if you try to get joy from people validating you or accepting you or approving you, you're never going to get joy because you're always going to have people who don't like you. That's just the nature of the beast. If nothing else, somebody's always going to try to discredit you to keep uh, other people from liking you. Mm-hmm. So no matter what we do, I find, you know, the only way I found to avoid criticism is to do nothing. And then somebody will criticize you for doing nothing. <laughs> and so it's part of it. But in the body of Christ, sometimes we, and I think, Randy, quite honestly, we have this um, star mentality that's very prominent today in the church where we push people to the forefront front and we make them celebrities. And by making them a celebrity, um, we think, wow, man, boy, if I could just be like them or doing it. But in reality, I know so many people that are what we would call Christian celebrities. And I'm amazed how many of them have told me privately, there's no joy in that. I do it because 
that's what God called me to do. But I really wish I could just be home and not have to go out on the stage. And yet there are thousands who think, boy, if I could just be on the stage like they're on the stage, I'd be happy. And in reality, again, happiness is not in a person. It's not in a position. It, it's not in anything except our relationship with the Lord where we glorify him and we find that purpose and we do it. Yeah, you're right. And I, and having been raised by a man who was recognized widely, especially right. back when he was doing the big crusades and stuff in the 70s and 80s, I can tell you, it ain't all it's cracked up to be. And there are some times, right. I, honest, honestly, I'd rather be anonymous when I go have lunch, you know, and not have people <laughs> coming up to you all the time of with, course. sharing their problems too. But yeah, so I hear you. It, my People have also said if, if to my dad, if you could just pray for me, my dad's like, I am not Jesus. You, right. you can pray. Your, your husband, your wife, your, that, that believer in your life, your pastor can pray for That's you right. and be as effective as I am. All right, I'm going to show people your website. This is philwaldrip.org. Uh, and Phil, you, I mentioned earlier a couple of these conferences, uh, the Women mm -hmm. of Joy and the uh, Celebrators, both of which have their mm -hmm. URLs, and I'll put those in the chat for you guys who are watching chat. But um, I, 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 before we get back to the topic of uh, happiness and joy, mm -hmm. um, Give people a little bit of overview because I want people to be aware of what you're doing because some right. people will really be interested in being involved in this. Oh, sure. We, in fact, we just finished up our season of our Women of Joy. We do those mostly across the Southeast. They are events uh, designed by women for women uh, to grow in their relationship with the Lord. You mentioned Sheila Walsh often speaks at those, a dear friend. Um, but we have many leading uh, speakers from across the country who come in, uh, great Bible teachers. We actually have some Christian comedians that we make the whole weekend. It's a Friday night through Sunday morning. Um, Saturday afternoons are free. And we have a little mixture of everybody. And the women come. In fact, um, not only are we one of the fastest growing women's conferences in the country, but we're also one of the rarities that whenever we finish a conference with several thousand women, when we leave, more times than not, we're already sold out for the next year. So in women, women of joy, it's it's a simple, you can do a simple search and see where we are around the country. And then we also, uh, we do celebrators. In fact, we just finished up. We do one celebrators a year. We used to say it was for senior adults. And then we discovered nobody wants to be a senior <laughs> adult. And so we just call everybody mature believers. But it's really for retired people. That's what it's designed for. But people of all ages come. And it's actually four days in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Yes. Um, just finished that up last Thursday night with several thousand um, retirees there. We had a lot of fun. Um, many well-known people were there. Dr. David Jeremiah is, um, this was his 22nd year of being a guest preacher with us mm -hmm. and always preaches. Uh, I share a special message and Bill Gaither was there and we had the Collinsworth family and um, even former Vice President Mike Pence came in for a non-political event we did just to honor the veterans. So it was a great night. And so if people just want to come for four or five days and Get away and Pigeon Forge is a great, it's just called Celebrators and you can go to celebrators.org and find out all about it. It'll be next October. We'll be announcing the lineup and the program very soon. Very cool. Now, I, I no longer feel offended for not having gotten an invitation to Celebrators. I'm, I'm <laughs> kind of glad at this point. So, But no, you can you check that out. Celebrators.org, womenofjoy.org, it's in the chat, or you can just go to philwaldrip.org and find out more about that. Getting back to the book, uh, mm -hmm. Stop Chasing Happy, and this idea of of true joy godly joy mm -hmm. the one the kind that doesn't just wither when the circumstances right. change uh or when the hard times come because they will come you, when you look out at our culture right now uh mm -hmm. i know you see the same thing i do it, it, it i see okay I, there's there's this bifurcation if i can use that word there's there's this two things going on when i look at it's sort of the news I see people that are miserable and hate each other, right. or outraged, or they're mad about this. And I don't just mean like leftists outraged right. at the statue of Abraham right. Lincoln or something. I mean Christians who are outraged at the leftists who are outraged. And right. this, this, you know, the quickest way to degenerate people is either through fear or mm -hmm. anger. 
And right. it, 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 but then when I look at my personal life and, and I go have lunch, the person at, at the lunch place is, is polite. I go to a coffee shop. I might strike up a conversation with somebody. I go to church. People are, are happy. I mean, so there's mm-hmm. this weird thing that's going on. And I don't, I don't know. I don't want really to get into that, but I'm curious what you see out there when you see people who uh, aren't experiencing joy. What do you, what right. do you think it is that they're missing the most? Obviously, Christ. But <laughs> well, you know, I think we've grown up in a culture that has told us if we do A, B, C, D, and E, we're going to be happy. Mm. You know, how many how many college age students do I talk to and they say, well, you know, I just know that if I can finish my degree, I'm going to be in one of the top jobs in America and I'm going to be making all this money and I'm going to be retired by the time I'm 30. Well, they graduate from college and they find out that, well, you know, there's not as much demand for my skills as I thought. Okay. And so instead of being in what they borrowed a whole lot of money to get a degree to do, mm. they suddenly find themselves doing something that even to be close to what they got their degree in. And all of a sudden they get angry because they feel lied to. Mm. They feel mm. like they've been misled. Um, I think there's a lot of people, if I can make it even more personal, who who feel like, you know, well, I'm miserable. So if I can just marry someone, if I can just find a person and I will marry that person and then I'm going to be happy the rest of my life. And then reality sits in. As I as I often say, you know, there's dirty clothes and dirty diapers that come with marriage sometimes. Mm-hmm. And that's not always pleasant. And we discover this person that we saw at their best on a Friday night or Saturday night date mm-hmm. suddenly is not as kind. And so We really thought this person was going to give us joy, so we get angry. Mm -hmm. And I find a lot of the anger we have in our culture today is we feel people feel deceived and people feel like they've been misled, and in some ways they have. And as you know, Randy, today everybody can have a microphone. Everybody, I mean, no matter what, with all the social media and everything else and the Internet, everybody suddenly can be heard And it doesn't mean anybody's listening, but they can be heard. And I think sometimes people feel like then they go on a mission to correct everything. And if they can just do A, B, and C, then the world's going to be perfect. And then they become, they get angry because they can't change the world. And then when they get a little older, then they look back and, you know, I have a lot of fun today talking to older adults who were all hippies in the 60s. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, they really thought, man, we're going to change the world. And now you talk to them and they really don't like their younger self because they realize um, it wasn't, things weren't as bad as they thought. There were some things that needed changing, but they didn't go about the right way and made some very poor decisions in their own life in order to do that. So I think a lot of it is people today just are trying to fix their lives with something outside of themselves. And, you know, there are people who sometimes have gotten a bit upset with me because even in the midst of real struggles in life, I found I still wanted to get up the next morning. I didn't like some of the challenges I was going to have to have, but I still wanted to get up the next day and have that that joy in my heart because I felt God was at work. You know, I mentioned a moment ago that Paul wrote in the book of Philippians, And, you know, one of the things when you read that chapter, and I never noticed this before, Randy, maybe somewhere along the way somebody told me, but I I didn't remember it. You know, when Paul was writing to that church, um, that's the same church that in the book of Acts started when God sent an earthquake and set Paul free from prison. Hmm. And so Paul spends the first part of that talking about his joy, but talking about why he was in prison, because I'm sure some Christian was like, well, if you was as spiritual as you were back then, (laughs) God would send another earthquake and get you out of the prison. So, Paul, why are you in prison? And Paul explained, very simple, back to that purpose. Paul said, you know, I've been called to be an apostle. I've been called to share the truth of the gospel. And in the first time he was in Philippi, the earthquake gave him an opportunity to share the gospel. It it broadened his message. And he's in prison. And he says, you know what? I'm in the prison and God's doing the same thing because my purpose is to be an evangelist, to share the message of Christ. And now I'm in prison. And he says, you know the reason why I'm here? because they're chaining these guards to me. They can't go anywhere. And I'm sharing with them. And some of these guards are coming to know Christ. And even some people had come to know Christ were even in Caesar's household. Well, we don't know who that was, but at the very higher escalons of the Roman empire were coming to Christ because he was in prison. 
Paul understood God had a mission to glorify him, but his purpose was to share the gospel. That meant sometimes you get an earthquake and you get out of prison. Other times it means, nope, you know what? It means you have to stay in prison. But either way, Paul said, I'm rejoicing because God is fulfilling his mission and his purpose for my life. And when you can grab that truth, you're going to be absolutely amazed at how happiness and joy comes in your life. You, yeah, you keep saying that word, purpose. I'm mm-hmm. guessing that, that that really is when our purpose is rooted in Christ, but also it, it has to be a little more than that. In other words, sure. we have to understand our our role on the team, you know, if you will. Right. Uh, right. And I think that's where a lot of people struggle and, and where a lot of their unhappiness or frustration or mm-hmm. disappointment comes from is misunderstanding or how do you, that's a big question, but how do you find that purpose? Oh, well, here's what I tell people. Finding your purpose is sometimes so obvious that we miss it. So here's what I tell people to do. Sit down and ask yourself some questions here, just some fun questions, but here's one. What is it that you enjoy doing that when you do it, you lose all track of time? Uh, Now, I I don't mean playing video games, but I'm talking about (laughs) when is something you do that when you do it, you just find yourself thinking, wow, where's the day gone? Hmm. Well, when you when you start isolating that, all of a sudden you have also found your passion. And I am convinced that God takes our purpose and our passions and he merges them together to enable us to do what we do. Because see, when you know your purpose, there's going to be some hard days, but your passion keeps you going because you passionately are on a, uh, on a goal. You have a goal. You're on a mission right. to glorify God, but you're on a mission to achieve something for his glory. So I tell people, start with that. Number two is get some friends who will be honest with you. And ask them this question, what do you see in my life that I'm good at? Hmm. And it's amazing how I asked some friends at one time, and one of my friends said, I'll tell you what you you do well, Phil. And I said, okay, I want to know. And I was waiting for hear this, oh, you're a great preacher, a profound, but he didn't. He looked at me and he said, you have the ability to look people in the eye, encourage them, and make them feel like a million dollars. And I said, really? I'm just telling people how I feel and how well they did something. He said, no, trust me. There are very few people, he said that he had met, who could do that. And now if you look at our ministry with all the conferences we're doing and everything, it's all built around encouraging people. Mm -hmm. In fact, we call it encouragement for life. All sprang from someone seeing an ability and just built on that to where you want people to feel encouraged and to be encouraged. And then I'll also tell people, ask people, you know, to speak into your life, you know, because sometimes we want to be something. For example, when I was young, I wanted to be a singer. I wanted to be a singer so bad. Well, Randy, I don't know if you've ever heard me sing, but you would know that's not my purpose in life because I have no musical ability. I mean, I'm one of those guys that, you know, singing in church, people tend to move down the aisle a little bit because I can't sing. Well, when God made me, created me, that wasn't his purpose for me to be a singer. And I enjoy music, but I wasn't designed to be a singer. The good thing is God made every one of us different. Every single one of us have a different set of DNA and we all have different experiences. There's no two people in the world just like you. And when God got the DNA committee together to form you, um, I believe God put that purpose in you and he gave you those skills and abilities that he did. Now, you know, as a speaker, when I get up now, I tell people all the time, I don't understand stage fright. People tell me, oh, I just, I'm paralyzed. I have stage fright. And I look back and I think, you know, I've been nervous a time or two, but I don't know if I've ever been totally afraid of a stage. Well, people say, why do you think that is? I can't even identify because I think God called me to stand in front of people and to preach and to teach. And as a result of that, I'm not intimidated by the crowd because when God made us now, granted the devil will throw fears. Don't get me wrong. The devil will throw fears, try to keep you from doing it. Um, And in other ways, he's thrown fear at me about a lot of other things, Mm -hmm. but in reality, what God made us for the opportunity we have to serve God. And when we find that purpose and we do it, and we'll find there's joy in it. And as we ju- there's joy that comes in life. And as a result, happiness, as I said, is the byproduct. You don't have to chase it. It comes when you find what God created you to do and do it. Absolutely. And you know, when you find that, also find that 
it doesn't mean there's less work. It means right. there's more joy in the work and there's less striving. There's just right. that natural naturalness. But I, I love it. I love it. This is the book, Stop Chasing Happy by Phil Waldrop, available now wherever you get books. Uh, you can check out philwaldrop.org. Uh, and Phil, is there anything else I, I missed? Anything else you want to say? I sure appreciate your time. It's such an encouragement. Oh, man. I love every minute. I love you, Randy. I love your family. And uh, you guys have been a great inspiration to me along the way. And so I'm just honored to be able to sit here and share with you because really what I want is people to find joy. And I, I should have said this earlier. You know, somebody defined joy this way for me. Joy is the absence of boredom. And I think in some way that's true, that we don't go through life bored because we have a mission, we have a purpose, and God's going to keep working that purpose in us until the day he takes us home to glory. So, you know, that's the good part about having a purpose every minute, every day. You have a mission. You have a reason for living. And when you find that reason, you find joy. <laughs> I love it. And Sheila Walsh just popped on, so she's... She thinks it's great to see you on. So Sheila uh, says hello. <laughs> I love, I love Sheila Walsh. She, Debbie and I, um, seriously, her, uh, Sheila, her husband, her family are some of the favorite people. And she is so uh, gifted as a communicator, mm -hmm. but she's just gifted as a person. I mean, she's one of those few people that can talk right. I tell people she gets through the exterior. She goes right through the, through, through your heart to the very core of who you are makes a difference. We love Sheila, and she is a precious person, and she loves you guys too, that's for sure. Well, and we appreciate her. This is a little Sheila Walsh praise at the end of this show, and I got to tell you, <laughs> see, my wife hates being on camera, hates being on stage, right. and I dragged her up here and made her do some shows, and so now that Sheila's sitting next to me, uh, Sheila's probably my, my wife's favorite person on the face of the earth next to me, of course. <laughs> and so, and it's by finding that role, you know, you got to find right. that role. That's, That's not right. my wife's, but it's Sheila's, and I'm honored to be able to sit next to her. Anyway, appreciate you again, Phil. And uh, Thank you, and Randy, time, as absolutely, always. Absolutely. Appreciate you guys hanging out, watching. Hit share, hit follow, hit like, hit subscribe, whatever you can hit, uh, and it'll tell you when there's more interviews on, and you'll get to see more great People like Phil Waldrop on on the show. Be encouraged uh, and, and get some deeper roots, spiritual roots, so you can have those beautiful fruits. We'll see you again next time here on Life Today Live. They imagine it's the Holy Spirit. They want to live the way they want to live and have the Holy Spirit as a bit of uh, something extra. The Holy Spirit must be Lord.